Hey there, my name is Ashley Palmer and I'm the Stream Monitoring Coordinator at the Northern Virginia Soil and Water Conservation District. Since 1945, we've been helping residents of Fairfax County manage their land for conservation and assist in preserving their natural resources. Our stream monitoring program has grown to be one of the largest and longest running programs in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Each year, we work with the Virginia Save Our Streams program out of the Isaac Walton League and hundreds of volunteers to assess streams just like Sugarland Run here to see where they may be most impaired and where we can be of the most assistance. Today, I'm going to show you some of our local streams and we'll take a look at how we monitor them. When we get in the stream, we're looking for aquatic, benthic, macroinvertebrates, or macros for short. These organisms will be found in the water and at the bottom of the stream. They'll be big enough to see with your naked eye, but will still be quite small. Finally, the organisms we are looking for will have no backbone, so we don't count fish. We can determine the health of our stream by looking at the number and biodiversity of macros we find. To collect our macros, we follow the Virginia Save Our Streams protocol, or instructions. First, we look for a good riffle in the stream. A riffle is an area where water flows quickly over fist-sized rocks and has more dissolved oxygen for the macros to breathe and often better habitat. When we look for our macros, we need the right equipment. In the stream, we need boots to keep our feet dry, gloves to protect our hands from sharp rocks, and of course, a net to catch our macros in. After collecting the macros, we need tweezers to collect our organisms, a guide to help us with identification, and a microscope or magnifying lens. We'll be able to see them with our naked eye, but the microscope will help us to get a closer look at their identifying features, like the number of tails and legs they have. We also need a container with water to put them in. Remember, most of our macros have gills and all of them breathe in water, so they need to stay in the water. Now that we have selected a ripple that we want to sample, it's time to set up our net. We want to set up our net so that the water is flowing through the net downstream and any organisms in our sample area will make it into the net. For reference, our sample area is one square foot in front of the net. We'll put the net in place and tilt it back as far as we can to capture some more of those organisms as they move through. We collect the macros from our sample area by using gloved hands to rub the rocks on the bottom, which will dislodge any organisms that might have been hiding on them. We also use a rake to disturb the substrate or the bottom of the stream. This will get out any organisms that may have been hiding on the bottom. The macros we collect will be sorted into three categories. The first is pollution sensitive. Macros in this category cannot live in pollution. Macroinvertebrates that would be considered pollution sensitive include stonefly nymphs, mayfly nymphs, riffle beetles, larvae and adults, and water pennies and other beetles. The second category is somewhat sensitive macros. Macroinvertebrates that are somewhat sensitive to pollution may be able to live in polluted water for some of their lives or for a short time and still be able to survive in that habitat. Macros that are somewhat sensitive can include dragonfly nymphs, sow bugs and scuds, clams, net spinning caddisfly larvae, and dobsonfly, fishfly, and outerfly larvae, also called helgramites. The last category of macros is called tolerant macroinvertebrates. Tolerant macroinvertebrates can live in polluted water, although they wouldn't like to. Tolerant macros can include midgefly larvae, leeches, blackfly larvae, aquatic worms, flatworms, and lung snails. We can determine the health of our stream by looking at the number and biodiversity of macros we find. If we find that our stream is polluted or impaired, we can take simple actions at home to help keep our streams healthy. The most common types of pollution are excess nutrients, sediment, and trash and litter. 
Excess plant nutrients, like nitrogen and phosphorus, enter streams through runoff from farms or lawns that use fertilizers, as well as from pet waste that wasn't picked up. These are carried into the stream and excess nutrients can cause algal blooms, which can block out the sunlight and cause other aquatic plants to die. In extreme situations, this can lead to dead zones, where there is no longer enough dissolved oxygen for aquatic life, like our macros. You can prevent excess nutrients by using fertilizers in the appropriate amount and not before a big rainstorm, and by picking up after your dog. Sediment enters the stream through the erosion of stream banks during heavy rainstorms or from loose soil near the stream. The sediment later covers the bottom of the stream and makes poor habitat for macros. You can prevent sediment from entering streams by covering any loose soil around your yard and encouraging water to enter the soil where it falls by planting native plants with roots that suck up the water. Trash and litter enter the stream through runoff from roads, parks, and neighborhoods. Any trash entering a storm drain is deposited into a nearby stream. You can prevent trash and litter in your stream by engaging in stream cleanups, picking up trash or litter you see in your neighborhood, and by always putting your waste in the trash. I hope that you've enjoyed our introduction to stream monitoring today. If you'd like to learn more, please visit our website to learn about the stream monitoring program and how you can join us at an upcoming stream monitoring workshop. Remember, these macros are depending on people like you to prevent pollution and keep our local streams a great place for macros to live.